But last Sunday, I was talking about, well, actually, this is my ninth sermon on listening to the voice of God. That God speaks through the power of His Holy Spirit. And He speaks, the Bible tells us, through a whisper. And we need to hear Him. And God has many wonderful things He wants to say to us. And we need to grow close to Him. We need to, to have that prayer life that can become alive. And last week, I was in John 15, and I talked really about Jesus. It says there in verse 1, Jesus is the vine. Is the vine. And we are the branch that's grafted into the vine. Verse 6 says we are the branch. So He is the life-giving substance. Stay with me now. And the Holy Spirit is that which flows through the vine and into the branches. And for those of us who were uh, not called of God, we're not God's people, we were sinners, but we were grafted in. We received the salvation that comes through Jesus, and we were grafted into the vine. And we abide in Him. And the life flows through the vine into us. And we're fruit hangers, right? Well, he hangs fruit on the branch. And that's what we are. We are the things that God works in and with and through, and great fruit comes from those things. Fruit, more fruit, much fruit, fruit that remains. But he also says there in verse 1, John 15, that he is the vine, but the Father is the vine dresser. Some versions say husbandman. Some say the gardener. He's the one who watches out and takes care of the vine through His wisdom, through His knowledge, through His tender care, as we are grafted into the vine, He looks at it and makes sure that everything is done exactly right. As a matter of fact, John 15, verse 3, He says, You are already clean because of the Word which I have spoken to you. And that really is talking about how the gardener, our Heavenly Father, the Sovereign God of the universe, how he takes such good, gentle care of us. Now, you know, a, a grapevine will grow long. The branches will grow long. And they may get down in, in the dirt and become dirty. And where they can't be, uh, uh, can't be the great fruit producers they could be. So it's the gardener's job to come in and to, to hold them up. And to make sure that they, they get held up and out of the dirt. And to clean the branches, to clean the leaves on the vine to take care of. Now, yes, I wanted to, to, to talk once a moment again. Everything comes through Jesus. Yes, I want us to have an ear to hear the Holy Spirit because all that good comes through the vine, the Holy Spirit, and into our lives. But the Father takes care. And that which is a distraction. That which is, 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 serves no good purpose, he cuts off. And in the areas in our life where we're bearing fruit, he'll come and at the right season and in the right way, he'll prune so that it can produce stronger, greater fruit. And that's what our Father does for us. He looks out for us in our lives. In His wisdom, love, and care, He makes sure that everything is in order, though the world may be out of order. And when I think of all the things that John 15 says, this wonderful abiding relationship, let me remind you two more quick things. He said, for without me, you can do, say it loud. I think they heard you all the way at home. That's good. You can do nothing. Just to understand that. If you think that you, you're the essence of good, if you think that you can produce the fruit, you're mistaken. All we can do is stay grafted into Jesus, and He produces fruit through us. We can do nothing without Him. But we can do great things through Him. But what happens if we don't see it? What happens if we want to be the great 
fruit bearers, if we want to be the valuable to God, if we want to be valuable to others, if we want God to use us, if we want our life to matter, but yet we don't see it. That's what Habakkuk saw here. So if you want to look in the Old Testament to the book of Habakkuk, chapter number 3, if you'll stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. I love the book of Habakkuk. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Habakkuk, chapter number 3, verse number 17. This is what God's Word says. Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vine, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet. and He will make me walk high on the hills. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father God, I thank you for giving us the completeness of your word. My Father, I thank you that you are sovereign, that you are strong, that you are great, that you are mighty, that you hold the world in your hand. Lord, that you watch out for us even when we do not realize it and know it. That you take care of us and have plans for us. Plans for good. Plans that we may prosper. Plans that we may bring you glory and honor and praise, that our life can be fruit bearing. Thank you for sending us Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. Thank you that through the cross of Calvary, we can become and become part of Christ. And thank you, Holy Spirit, sent from the Father, flowing through Jesus, living within our hearts to give us the wisdom and the knowledge that we need, to give us life and to give it abundantly. Lord, thank you that you forgive us of our sins and make us useful in Christ, that you can make us fruit hangers. Christ, that you can get glory from our life. And I do pray, Lord, for fruit. Teach me to abide in you. God, as you take care of us, for without you I can do nothing. But Lord, speak to us today because in the difficulties of circumstances, sometimes we don't see the reality and the purpose of what you're doing. So let us hear from you, Holy Spirit. Teach us your will and your ways. And sir, we'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor. We say amen, it is true, so be it. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I love the book of Habakkuk, uh, written by a prophet of God in the Old Testament. And he was just one of those guys that if he had a question, he wasn't shy about asking it. If he didn't understand, he would go and he would say, God, I don't understand. Help me to understand. So in the book of Habakkuk, literally it's a book of questions and answers. Habakkuk would ask a question. He didn't know. God would give him an answer because God's a God of love. He's not holding out on us at all in any way. And then Habakkuk would reply to that. And then God would once again reply further to give a further, a further word, a further help in that time. So here Habakkuk is really a little bit angry. He's a little bit, really a little upset because he sees that the people of Israel, God's people, are going through a hard time, a difficult time. And what he sees happening is he sees in the life of these people called the Babylonians. They seem to be doing well. As a matter of fact, they don't like Israel, and they, they, they are wanting to expand. They are wanting to grow, and they don't care what it costs 
because it's all about them. So they'll come in with their armies and they'll tear down cities and they'll destroy and they'll steal and they'll take people as slaves. And everywhere they go, they are conquering. They are the first world empire, a one world government. And Nebuchadnezzar is sitting on the throne, and Habakkuk doesn't like it. And he's griping and he's complaining to God, Lord, why are you doing this? Why are you allowing this to happen? And why are you allowing these evil people to prosper? You ever had questions? You ever want to go to God and say, why, Lord, why? Why are these things happening? Lord, why are these people, good people, getting sick? Why are those others that are unconcerned, that are not seeking to bring you honor and glory, why is it that they seem to be doing well? Why is it that that person that steals, why is it that they're getting rich? Why is it that that other person who, who is always cunning and conniving, why is it it seems like they're the ones that are prospering? Lord, I don't understand. And that's exactly what God said back to him. I know you don't know. I know you don't understand. Because see, what, what's happening here is bigger than you. I'm doing a work that even if I told you, you wouldn't understand it. You see, what's happening is, I know tragedies happen to you, but I'm there for you. I'm looking out for you. I'm taking care of you. But what you don't realize is I'm doing a work in the Babylonians. Now, let's just pause and think about this. Our God's the God of the whole world. Amen? Seven billion people. He knows every hair on every head. Seven billion people. And He knows every thought in every heart. Seven billion people that Jesus loved enough to go and to give His precious life on the cross of Calvary, that if they would repent of their sins and believe in Him and trust in Him for life, that they could be saved as well. Seven billion people. But yet sometimes all we care about is our community, our friends, our family, our life, what we feel, what we want. Come on now. What we think. So God, I don't understand this. And Habakkuk says to him, I don't know, but God says, it's okay, Habakkuk. I got this. So in chapters 1 and chapters 2, they go back and forth asking questions, God giving an answer. And here's what I want you to see today. When we get to chapter 3, chapter 3 is a prayer to God. It is a prayer of thanksgiving. It's one of the greatest prayers in all of the Bible. Coming from someone who was questioning God. Who didn't understand. But now Habakkuk has settled in to say, Okay, God, you're God and I'm not. You're great and I don't always do the right things. And I am so very grateful that you got this. When everything seems upside down, you got the whole world in your hand. And by the way, I'm grateful, I'm grateful that your ways are better than my ways. So when he gets to verse 17, he says, Though the fig tree may not blossom, I know you created it to create blossoms and figs, but sometimes the fig tree doesn't blossom. The grapevine. I mean, its purpose is to produce grapes, but sometimes there is no, not fruit on the vine. Though all the labor that goes into the olive trees to take care of it, though the olives don't come forth and there's no, no produce there and it fails, though all the labor producing the, the crop in the field, and the fields still yield no food. Think about that person that 
worked and did everything that they could. They go out in the fields. No food. Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, the great shepherd looks out, but the sheep are gone. There be no herd in the stalls. Barrenness. Are y'all all right with that? Hardship. Hunger. Need. I think it hits close to home when it hits us. One of the things that God does in the life of people who are seeking to draw closer to Him in fasting is because they realize when those hunger pains come how much they need the blessings of God. And that would be for a season. But could you imagine what it would be like if all your labor seems like it's in vain and all your, all your strength is gone and all you see is barrenness and hardship? You may look to God and you may blame God. God, why? That's what Habakkuk was doing. God, why don't you straighten things out? God, I don't understand. Why is it that evil people seem to be prospering? I'm reminded of Psalms 37 when it says, They shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Lord, I don't understand. Why is it that your people are going through hard times and the ones who don't care, they seem like they're getting by with it? We blame God. Let me just remind you, He is the one who's sovereign. He is the one who's in control. He is the one, you can't take another breath without Him. He gives us everything in life. I love what it says here, yet, in verse 18. Though everything looks upside down, He says, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I know who's in charge. I know the one who is beautiful. I know the one that the smile on his face creates peace in the hearts of his people. When you're hurting, what you're looking for is peace. When you're hungry, what you're looking for is something to fill your soul. When you're sick, you're looking for the balm of Gilead that can come in and make things right. And that's who God is. But Habakkuk said, God, I know you. I know your nature. I know you're loving, but I just don't see it. What do you do when you don't see it? Rejoice in the joy of your salvation. You see, really, when we come to the end of this and we hear this prayer, nothing of the circumstances has changed except Habakkuk's attitude. His view. He still doesn't see all that God's doing. And yet, he's trusting God in the moment. He may not understand why God wants to raise up the Babylonians. He may look at them and say, evil people strike them down. And yet, he is grateful that there's a God that's in charge that's greater. Sometimes, When we don't understand things, we blame God. But you know, sometimes when bad things happen, we blame ourselves. You ever blamed yourself? God, I know you want to do great things. But Lord, maybe it's my fault. Maybe I'm the reason. Maybe I'm the reason why there's no olives on the olive tree. Maybe I'm the reason there's no grapes on the vine. Maybe I'm the reason... The crop has failed. Maybe, Lord, it's my fault. Let me just ask you, isn't God bigger than you? Can't God do things even through us? Can't God produce the bounty for everyone else, even through old withered branches like us? 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I was the withered branch that was about too far gone. But in the nick of time, at the right season, because of his love, he took me and grafted me into the vine. And the flow of Jesus came now in and through me and cut off all that that was dead so that new life could come even through someone like me. When you get down on yourself, don't you understand that you're down on the one that God loves? That God wants to smile His blessings upon? and Give His great grace through? I love this. It's just so wonderful. The Lord God is my strength. When you're talking bad about yourself, you're really talking bad about Him because the strength comes from God. We can do nothing on our own. Really, we're bad-mouthing God when we're saying, God, you can't use me. I want to tell you this. I know of no one in Scripture who went through life without troubles. Swallow that. Chew on it a while. I know of no one that God used mightily in the example that He gave us in His Word that He first did not break mightily. There were those who had questions. There were those who didn't have all the answers who were going through it. I wonder how Daniel felt when he was crying out to God on his knees and yet he got up and said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Facing the lion's den, but yet trusting in his Father. I wonder about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who went to the Garden of Gethsemane, broken, spilled out, did not want to go to the cross, said, Lord, if there's any other way, nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. Did God strengthen him? Come on. Did God use him? As his life flowed from him, his life flowed to me. As he gave his life a ransom for sin and was resurrected, it meant I could have new life. Was it easy on him? Do I fully understand why he had to be beaten and whipped? Why he had to go through such hardship? And yet that is the spring that new life comes from. If it had not been what Christ went through, we would have nothing. We don't have to understand it all. We just understand that God's got this. He is our strength. He says He will make my feet like the deer's feet where I can go and walk the high hills of glory to take me to places Oh, I might want to go down to the valley where the grass is green and the still waters are there. But no, He helps us as we go through the valley. We can now climb high on the mountain and stand no matter what comes. When I was thinking of this, my mind went to the book of Romans written by Paul. Paul was used mightily of God. And yet, he suffered mightily as well. He was beaten. He was beaten with rods. He was whipped with whips. He was shipwrecked. Not once, not twice. Three times. He was stoned and left for dead. And yet God wasn't through with him. Imprisoned once, twice, three times. And yet, even to the day that he laid down his head and they cut off his head, he would freely give his life for the benefit of others. And when he's writing this book, I love the book of Romans, and he's writing it to those Gentiles, those Romans, those who were so wrapped up in mythology and all those other gods of stone and of wood. When he gets to the end of it, and he's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he's writing all these wonderful truths, he just pauses and breaks out in a doxology. He's just got to pause and praise God. And when you get to Romans chapter 11, 
verse 33. Hear the words of God. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Oh, the depths of the riches of the knowledge of God. How unsearchable. No, you can search for it. You'll never understand all the judgments of God. All of his ways. It's beyond finding out. His wisdom so far. How could we with these small finite minds understand the infinite God? How could we understand all of the things that God's doing? He tried to tell Habakkuk, you don't understand it, you'll never know it, but what I'm doing is something so much greater. My dear friends, that's what he's doing in our life. Something so much greater. Just because we don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not true. We used to sing a song. We'll understand it better in the by and by. That may be true, but I think the writer really hit it there when he said, he didn't say we'll understand it all. He said we'll understand it better. There's some things I may never fully know. My brother, 24 years old, had been married three months, doing something for his wife and his wife's family, hit by a drunk driver, and his precious, beautiful wife was killed. So young, 21, so much life ahead of her, never hurt anyone else, never did anything wrong to anybody else, only married three months. And I look at that and I say, I don't understand. And it's like God says, I understand. You don't understand. And yet, I cannot tell you in Kay's life that I knew for only a short time how much my life has been benefited. I've been at the hospital bed when the child goes away from the family. I've seen families go through so very much and never know why. And yet how unsearchable are the ways of God. His ways beyond knowing and finding out. You really get to that point where you just say, you know what, though everything seemed terrible, I will still rejoice in the joy of my salvation. I don't have, God doesn't have to come get my approval. Matter of fact, look at this in, in, in Romans chapter 11. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has become his counselor? God doesn't come get approval from me. It's not like he comes and says, Brian, you know, I was thinking about doing this. What do you think? Do you think it'll be okay if I do this? He's the God of the universe. I'm not his counselor. His ways are beyond my ways. Look what it says here. He says, who is first given to God and it shall be repaid to him? It's like I've given to God so God owes me something. You ever made a deal with God? Lord, if you'll get me out of this, I promise you I'll, right? Or Lord, don't you understand? I've done all these things. I kind of expected something back. No, no. His ways are so much greater. Verse 36, Romans 11, verse 36 says this. Paul says, for of him, of God, and through him, and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. It is true, so be it. I don't understand everything in life, but I know that he does, so I'll just trust him. I don't understand all the ways of God. I just trust his hand. And when I don't understand, I trust his heart. I know that he's never made a mistake. 
So he's not going to make one today. Those seven billion people that he loves, those seven billion people that he's watching over, those seven billion people that he would do anything that if they would repent of their sins and come and cry out to him and tell him that they believe and ask him to be Savior and Lord, he would do exactly that. He would save them, be their Lord, their God. I don't understand all that's going on in our world. I don't understand everything that's going on in our families here. I don't have to understand the reasons. I just know and trust the one who knows. How long will it be this way? That's what Isaiah said in Isaiah 6. Lord, how long? And to whom? You know, God said a real encouraging word there. Basically, he said to him, as long as it takes, and by the way, only a remnant will receive it. And yet, Jesus was willing to come, even if narrow was the way that led to life. And most wanted to go broad that leads to destruction. Yet he loved us enough to still come I wonder today your love for God is it only when the sun is shining or do you love him when there's clouds do you love him when everything is roses but do you love him even when you find the thorn do you love him when all of your health is good or do you love him even when your health seems to be fleeting? Do you love him when you're strong and on the mountaintop and singing praise? But do you also love him when he leads you through the valley of the shadow of death? He's worthy of our praise, no matter what. That's why I think Habakkuk ended his prayer in praise. That's why I think when Paul was writing the book of Romans, he had to stop and give God praise in the midst of it from a jail cell, understanding that even then, God was at work. God is wonderful. God is great. We just need to receive it. We need to trust Him. What happens if you don't get what you want? You praise God that he's going to give you something better. 